very misleading for teachers. I hate it because it makes our students feel a little degraded and insulted. But it is the term that we have to use on a federal level, and it's called English language learner. And it is a term assigned to those students that have any other language exposure in their home other than English. What I prefer to look at all of our dual language students as are apps. Here at Hollister, we have great apps. We have amazing bilingual <laughs> students. And so it is my passion and my goal to change the perception of these students, starting with the students. Because a lot of them don't see themselves as amazing bilingual students, because we're always, you know, you need to read better English, you need to write better English, you need to speak better English, you've got to work on your English, your English scores aren't high enough in the access. When ultimately, how cool is it that they speak another language? So my goal is to embrace that. I have a lot of students, and most of them are what's in your middle school and your high schools, that have officially exited out of the ELL program, but they still need some advocating, and they still need support, and I still need to work with their family. So by putting the entire district under this umbrella of amazing, bilingual students, we can show the world, hey, we got great apps. Come look at them. So, start looking at your students as amazing, bilingual students, and that way I just get to encompass more of them and really showcase what they are capable of. Um, just so you know, I do have a program model. I'm not going to put that up right now because I know that needs a lot of time. But um, there's a lot of times that, I mean, I even wonder what it is I do. And so I worked really hard last year to make kind of a model that has five main pillars. And um, there's five main core things that you need to look at to have a good ELL program district-wide. And every day I look at those and I think, okay, what are we doing okay at? What can we do better? What do we not have in place now? And so every day I go to my desk and I look at those five pillars and I wonder where we need to operate under the most on that day and what are my big rocks under these titles that day. This will be in a folder that I'll tell you about later if you ever want to look at our district-wide program model. Um, it's under the whole umbrella of ads, so I welcome you to look at that. So today, um, I said, uh, Mrs. Leach and I went through this program model at the end of last year, and we highlighted, you know, we think we do these things well. Um, I think we can do some improvement here, and then a couple of things we just don't have in place yet. So today, I want to talk to you about two things that I feel like um, we can do use some improvement in, and so I'm going to share that with you today. One of, the, one of my five pillars is, is I, need to, I needed to choose an appropriate program model and ensure that it is well understood by all staff members. So that's what I'm here to help you with today, is just make sure you know what program model is in place for your buildings. Um, so building level intervention, K through first, just so you know, at the ECC, I do have instructional support this year, thank goodness, and she's wonderful. Ginger Wright goes to the ECC every morning. She started our first full week of school. We've never been able to have intervention that soon during the year. And she pulls those kids 30 minutes Monday through Thursday. So I cannot wait to see how that's going to affect our program as those kids come through. Second through fifth grade, um, I have designated um, ELL teachers that we cluster the students in. I work directly with those teachers. And some of those classrooms, I do pull some students to work with. Some of those, but mostly it's teacher support and weekly collaboration with those teachers. At the middle and high school level, it's a lot of check-ins. I was at the high school on Tuesday. I got to see almost all the kids having a hard time finding a place. The library was closed. So I went to another room and didn't have a phone. But I found as many kids as I could. So my goal is on Tuesdays and Thursdays, use those days to come to the building, just do some checking with those kids, see if there's any scheduling problems, what can I help them with, that sort of thing. Also, teacher collaboration and support. If you have an ELO in your classroom, I can work with you on certain things to support that student in your classroom. The second thing I want to know that's in my program model is making the success of ELL an essential issue for, for the district. And so one of the things I thought I could do better at was um, helping all staff members understand the program model and the actions and practices that we're all responsible for. Um, I am the ELL coordinator, but we all have responsibilities, as we do with all of our students. It's no different than other students. So we're going to play a little ELL trivia. Who is our ELL coordinator and what is his or her role? Me, yes. And what is my role? 
for this. Okay, perfect. I had prizes last week because we waited together. It looks like you got your prize for food. So sorry, you gotta add a word or add your Um so I am Mary McClinton here for those that are you. I coordinate the learning of the ELL students, I oversee compliance, and I advocate for the families and the students. What is a loud plan and do we have one? Anybody know? A loud plan is a, is a legal document that was driven by a Supreme Court decision. We do have one. We wrote it a couple of years ago. It had to be presented and approved by the board. And it's a step-by-step -step plan of all the federal compliance, the procedures, the processes, and um, that is what we follow. So just so you know, but you better rest. Does your district have a loud plan? You say, well, yes, we And I know where to find it. That will also be in the Google Play. Um, so it's a lot of legalese, a lot of uh, processes, but it does find everything out in the district on what we do. It keeps us in compliance. How many ELLs do we have in the Hollister School District? Very close. We have 50. We have um, 50 overall. In the middle school, we have eight active, and by active, I mean they still um, fall under that need services. Uh, with their with their Rita Access scores and four that are on monitor status. At the high school, we have three that are active. Those three are still in that status to do more to attendance and other issues at this point, but they still have to be in their active status in one monitor. Why do I hear the words like Rita and Access, and why do I need to know what they mean? Does anybody know what that is? <coughs> It does. WIDA is the company, the testing company that we use. Missouri is in a consortium with 38 other states, and we all use this same testing company to test proficiency of English language learners every year. Our testing window is from the end of January to the beginning of March, just before all the math stuff starts going. It's a mandatory test. It measures growth. Um, you have to show improvement. Um, it's basically my math for ELL. And it's important <coughs> um, to know when I work with teachers what those scores mean, but also it's just important to know that that is part of our program, because if you're ever asked, you use the lead access for proficiency testing, you say, mm hmm, yes, we do. Um, how do we know when an ELL is in our district? How do we know when an ELL is doing First, we know just from listening to them asking them questions. Um, that's our second tier. First is registration. It is with our building secretaries. They are our first line of defense. And those ladies have a lot of responsibilities, and this is one more. When students enroll, they have to fill out what's called a home language survey. If any language other than English is listed on that survey, that survey is given to me. And if they're a new student, I have a screener that I have to give the student, and then depending how, how they score that screener. Though you are correct, sometimes that gets missed. I know you're gonna not believe this, but sometimes parents lie. They <laughs> do. And so, um, and I can usually tell it when they write that they only speak English, but they write it in Spanish. That's a red flag to me to go investigate. And, and it happens. And so, you know, I have I have by law I have to investigate that. And so, Charlene, you are my second line of defense. If you ever feel like a student is in, in your classroom and they need to be for some sort of language barrier, second language um, uh, in the home, just let me know, okay? Because we we have that process at the front, but sometimes we don't always we don't always get them all. So please know that you are are the second screener. What if I suspect a language barrier issue with one of my students that they have not been labeled ELL? Call me email me. Um, do I have to send things home in Spanish? Yeah, they yeah. speak Spanish. <laughs> you do. Um, it, is, it is federal law that if the Spanish is the language of the home of the parent, you must send documentation home in Spanish. How do you do that? I prefer that, um, and I again, this will be in your resources folder that I'll tell you about in a moment. There's a, a website that I prefer. It's called Web Translation Fairly. Um, you put it in that, you translate it, there's a back translation, then send it to me, let me look it over. Um, but I will let you know if you have parents that are Spanish only. Um, we have a lot of parents that, if they mark, if I have it in my file, that they 
they are fine with having things home in English, then we are covered compliance-wise. But there are other parents that, I mean, it is, we have to send things to English. So I promise to let you know which of those parents are in the district. There's a few of them. And there's a few of them that I did have one teacher send me a very nice welcoming letter. And we have some parents that um, they are Spanish speaking, but they are not literate in their language. So it doesn't matter what you write. Um, maybe keep very simple, simple short sentences to get your point across. We translate that to Spanish, and that's the best we can do. Um, that's just an unfortunate situation. What does it mean when a student is on monitor status? The access for ELLs has an exit score of a perfect six in all domains, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Some students we can put on exit status if they make a 5.0 or higher, as long as their coursework also says that they're doing fine. We can go ahead and say, you know, this student can be a monitor status. They're going to be fine, and we can go ahead and start the exiting process. We can do that um, once they hit fourth grade, if they have two years of consistent math scores, of basic or above in English language arts, and they have a access score of 4.5 or higher. Uh, when a student is on monitor status, I will be emailing you a, a better Google form, hopefully, than I did last year, and working on it, um, just for you to check off some things that they're doing okay in class. And it's very important that you respond to those. I promise I'll make it as painless as possible, but those do have to be filled out quarterly in order for us to keep in compliance with that student and follow the monitoring process. Where can I find some resources? <coughs> High school has the has that span where there's the resources, and uh, Dr. Graham has maybe a folder that says ELL resources. So for you high school teachers, um, by the end of next week, I will have that full of resources, such as websites, scores, the students, the parents that need Spanish only sent home. Anything I think of that may or may not be pertinent to you, you can always go through there and look for resources. Middle school, I'll just have to make a share a folder and just share it with all of you. I don't know, because you don't have a site, do you, Dr. Page, like high school does? I don't think you do. So we have, we have, we have a new website, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'll find out where that is and put a folder there, and I'll drop anything that I think might be interested in. And if there's a particular teacher, like I may say, hey, Angela, I put something in there you might really find helpful today. Um, who is responsible for the education of an ELL? <laughs> okay, why is this all so important? One is because of ESSA, the Every Student, Every Student Succeeds Act, which is going to replace No Child Left Behind. <laughs> Achievement of ELLs is all going to be under Title I. Right now it's under Title III, and you only get Title III funds, and you only have to be accounted for the Title III if you have a certain amount of students. We don't have enough students, so we don't get anything for ELLs. So we have to be compliant, but there's really nothing we have to officially show for it yet. Starting with Every Student Succeeds Act, ELLs is all going to be under Title I, and it, there will be a lot more accountability, which I think is going to be a good thing. I'm not afraid of it. It'll, it'll just give it more importance, more guidelines for accountability. So it's just something you're going to hear a lot about. It's something that we're all going to have to be a part of. And the kids, and I have, I, I couldn't get it to work, I'm sorry, but I had a cute little boy dancing. And just remember, um, the heart and soul of these kids is their culture. And, you know, they're, they're, many of them were born here, and many of them are completely immersed in our culture. But they still go home to their culture. So embrace it, love it, look at them as amazing bilingual students. I'm here if you need me. Anybody have any questions?
homelessness so that we can talk a lot about it as well now for the last eight to ten years because homelessness has become such a problem in this country. A homeless student doesn't mean that that student is living in, uh, out in the woods somewhere, although that certainly is a possibility. Homeless means that you are not living in a fixed, regular, and adequate housing situation. It basically means if you are living under a roof, even if you're with your parents, but it's not your parents' roof, you're considered homeless. It means if you're a motel, you're considered homeless. It means if your mom, you have a single mom, and mom's living with her parents or her sister, you're considered homeless. The reason for that, and there are exceptions to it, the exception is if that parent is paying part of the mortgage of that house, and there's a sense of ownership to it, but a temporary situation declares that that child is homeless. That child is more likely to have lower test scores, is more likely to drop out of school, and is more likely to have behavior problems in school, which is why they are considered at risk. You may be really surprised that two years ago we were at 234 homeless students in our district, which was somewhere around 12% of our student population. We, and, and it's only because there are very few uh, long-term stay motels in our community that we don't have more of them. Last I heard, Branson had something like 250 kids just living in motels alone. So that percentage has got to be very, very high with them. But the important thing to remember is these kids need help. The law says that we need to provide them with all of the things that will make the playing field even for them like it is with other kids. In other words, we need to provide them with whatever they need in order to do extracurricular activities like other kids get to do. If they want to go out for the football team or the track team or basketball team or cheerleading and do not have money to buy uniforms or shoes or whatever, we are obligated to provide that for them because that evens the playing field and they can be discriminated against by being denied those extracurricular activities because they simply didn't have the money to participate. It includes field trips, the cost of field trips. It includes uh, membership in clubs like the FBLA or being able to go on some kind of an FBLA trip or uh, FFA trip, something like that. The whole idea with these kids, though, is to be aware of the circumstances. We do not have the homeless grant this year, and I think one of the reasons we don't have it, um, for one thing, we compete against schools. I know this is like a, a moment that just took my breath away when I was reading grants to find out that the St. Louis school system has 25,000 students, of which 5,000 are homeless. And I don't know how to even begin to deal with a situation like that with 5,000 students in terms of meeting their needs. What happened last year, though, was we dropped down 80-some students. And I think what happened is we didn't lose those students, but I think <coughs> there's a lack of communication a lot of times by their families. Kids enter school under one circumstance, and then things change. And I think it's particularly true with older kids because it's strange to me that our pre and reduced lunch figures at the middle school and high school are lower considerably than they are at the ECC and the elementary. And I guarantee, first of all, it's because those kids will not bring those forms back. And because it does not make sense that parents of older kids have more economic means than parents of younger kids. I mean, raise two daughters, and I know they get more expensive as they get older. Anyway, so it's really, really important as teachers to listen. When you overhear things such as, a kid getting kicked out of their house. Not every kid's going to tell you about that. Or a kid whose, whose mother and father have separated and mom now has to go live with her sister and that's where the kids are. All of those kinds of things are important. And the free and reduced lunch forms are important too. I have to tell you one of the reasons we are so successful with grants, and please don't take this wrong, but it's because our statistics make it possible for me to make us look very pathetic because we are very neat. So it's very important that we make sure we've got active statistics and we're not losing students who would count in those that would help us get some of that money. So if 
if you have any influence at all in terms of, and I know there's some incentives going on in regards to getting those free and reduced lunch forms back. Uh, last year, district-wide, we were at 74% across the district. But at the ECC and the elementary, I think they were like at about 77. But what brought that down was the middle school and the high school. So please keep that in mind and recognize how critical that is to getting extra money for extra programs. McKinney Vento, the way it operates, it also says that we need to help provide them with, with tutoring programs, et cetera, which we are a much more aggressive school district than a lot of schools in regards to our tutoring programs, which is great. But we need to recognize that sometimes those kids need extra things, such as maybe they need books to take home. I know one little girl, she's not homeless, but a little girl who's in our after-school program was telling me the other day she really likes to read books, but she didn't have any books at home. Well, in our after-school program, we, we bought up lots of, of books at garage sales and all kinds of things. So we have quite a library. So I'm loaning books out to her. The reason a lot of homeless kids do not check books out at the library is because their parents tell them not to do it. Because they may be moving, they may be moving pretty quickly, and things <coughs> get lost. Recognize that there's a whole different mentality with people who are poor. I'll talk about that in just a minute. I want you to also know that we do a fantastic job as a district because of some people who work their tails off in each building, for, especially for new teachers, to make sure you know this, there is a, for lack of a better term, a homeless closet at every building that has clothing, school supplies, those kinds of things in it. And any time you have a kid who has clothing that no longer fits, um, that has shoes that are put together with duct tape, those kinds of things, make sure here that you, you get a hold of Debbie Berkey or get a hold of Sandy Brown at the middle school. Uh, Teresa Gross is our homeless liaison, our, our homeless coordinator. I think of her as a procurer because whenever a, a child out there, homeless or not, who needs something, She's the one who's going to the store who finds out what size that child needs if we don't have that on hand. We are very blessed with some of the, the groups that we coordinate with, such as Gift of Hope. We just got a notice that for the month of, we've got a coupon, and they do this every year, that's worth $1,500 to go to uh, MC Sports and get tennis shoes for kids. So she goes and gets a wide variety of tennis shoes, and they work with us so that they get the tennis shoes that are on sale. So they can, they bring back a trunk load and usually a back seat load of tennis shoes. They're not buying $100 tennis shoes, but they're buying brand new tennis shoes. But let me put in a caveat here in regards to, and I think it happens more often with the younger kids than the older kids. One of the things we see happen is a kid who obviously needs shoes is brought in and gets a new pair of shoes. And three days later, that child doesn't have those shoes. You ask the child where the shoes went, and you found out mom gave them to their cousin or whatever, and they need another pair of shoes. So that's really important to watch, make sure that's not happening. Another thing that we really have to be careful of, and it's a sad thing to say, is making sure there's not lots of things that are going out that it makes you suspicious. Because um, actually Scott Winter and Greg Filiatro can, ha can tell you it was the kids who taught them this over at the Star School at the donation station. If you let too much new stuff go out to one family, it's going to be sold at a garage sale on Saturday. It's a whole different mentality that's very difficult for all of us to understand. But we've got hygiene items that are, that are available, which are especially important as kids get older, that are available. If you've got a kid who needs hygiene items, they're there. They also have the donation station. If you haven't been over there, you should go over there. The Star School kids run that as a retail business. There is no cost to families in the district. They come in, they register, they tell how many members there are in the family. And then they're given a certain amount per person of call it play money or paper money on the books per person that they can spend each month at the donation station. The kids have labeled every item in there a realistic price for, and, and most of it is 100% new material, otherwise it's real good quality material. Uh, winter coats, gloves, hats, all of those kinds of things, shoes, school supplies, hygiene items. And they can come in, and those kids are so smart at the Star School, they said you cannot give 
them the opportunity to spend 100% of their money, for example, on hygiene items, because they'll just clear out the shelf. So what happens is, I think everything's divided into about five categories. It's like school supplies and, and shoes, clothing, uh, household items, and, uh, and hygiene items. So they're allowed a certain percentage of what's available to their family to be able to purchase each month so that they cannot take advantage of the situation. At the, we have, if you have not been at the elementary, I wish you some time to drop over and have Teresa show you her, it's not really a closet, it's the size of a regular, a little bit smaller than a regular classroom, but I guarantee you it looks better than about 50% of the retail stores you'll go into in the community. Everything is so neat and lined up. You can find everything quickly. She's got the sock size, the underwear size, the shoe size. Everything is just perfect. So it's like going into a regular store to, to get things. It's very important if you have a kid who, let's say, maybe just get something. This is more likely at the small kid's size. But for example, if we have a child we know does not need new clothes, but they get muddy on the playground. They fall down and get muddy or whatever and need dry, clean clothing. What we do is give that child dry, clean clothing, but tell them they have to bring that clothing back the next day. We have to be very careful with the money we've got because the money right now that's running that closet and it's providing the needs for those kids comes out of Care for Kids money from Silver Dollar City, which is a real blessing for us. The nice thing about Care for Kids money is it's much more flexible than the, if we've got the homeless uh, grant because it means there's lots of kids out there who need help who aren't homeless, but whose families are in trouble. That money can be used, for example, if someone needs to go get food. I remember a couple of years ago, Sean Woods, when he was principal over here, called me and it was late on a Friday afternoon. A mom had been here who lived in Kirbyville and had, a child, had two children going here. The family was out of food and she did not know where she was going to get food for the weekend. They had used up all of their ability to get food from Cam. She was very concerned. She had a daughter at home who was pregnant, who was one of our former students. And Sean called me, and, I, and the end result was I went and bought a week's worth of staples for that family and things that I knew would get them through till they could be at Cam again. And that's what that money is there for, to be able to help families. It's also been used to do things such as there's been, I, I know, Pam Davis told me about a family, two little boys living in a local motel. The family had saved enough money that they could either pay first month's rent because it's not cheap to move into an apartment, or they could pay the deposit for utilities, but they didn't have enough money for both. The district paid whichever was, which was one or the other for them. That family was able to then move into an apartment in a much more stable situation and a much more positive situation. And the result was, I heard like a year later, they were still living in that apartment and things were going well for them. But sometimes people just need a hand up to get that extra up. That's what that money is for. So that's why it's very important that we be careful with how the money is spent. <coughs> people ask me last week at ECC and elementary, can we donate to that? Yes, because of the people I'm talking to. If you have good used clothing that is clean that you want to bring in, like winter coats, for example, gloves, or I've got two daughters who no longer live at home and cleaning out closets, there's all kinds of clothes that are still perfectly good that I've taken over to the donation station, for example. But we do not put the word out to the community because what will happen is Teresa will end up running a thrift store and she has had people bring things who are good hearted, but that have mold in them, that have spiders and things, that have been in somebody's garage for maybe two or three years in a bag, and the bag has rips in it. So that's why we're very careful about putting the appeal out. If you've got good things to bring, we, we trust this community. But reaching out to the whole community, it would be too overwhelming. Now, let me say something about poverty, and those are the handouts that I ask you to pick up. The very first one that I ask you to pick up, I, this is just to get you thinking about the mindset of some of our kids that they live in. The first one says, could you survive in poverty? And let me throw just a couple of things out, and these are for you to read 
read and think about and maybe discuss at home with your significant other. I know how to get it done, even if I have a fixed record. If you live in poverty, you probably know how to do that. I know how to live without a checking account. Yeah, share if you don't have it, or help yourself come up and get coffee. Does anybody in here have a clue how you exist without a checking account? To pay your bills? Uh, that's beyond my comprehension as to how you manage on a day to day basis if I don't have a debit card and I can't, and I don't have a checking account. Uh, do you know how to use a knife and scissors? I know how to move them in half a day. Those are just a few things that people in poverty have skills to be able to do, but it's probably almost impossible for all of us to think to place ourselves in. You compare that to middle class, which is on the back side, such as, I know which stores are most likely to carry their clothing brands my family wears. I know how to set a table properly. I know how to get the best interest rates for my new car with it. Those are skills that people in poverty do not have. Uh, I was going to run off a sheet about, uh, I know how could I survive in, in uh, upper class as a wealthy, in wealthy class. And frankly, I'm not sure anybody in here would be able to answer two of those questions because it, it blew my mind, the whole concept of, of some of the things. Uh, the comprehension of living, and we're not just talking a million dollars, we're talking millions of dollars. But it's a whole different education that kids come into and a mindset when they come to us at school. It's very hard for us to understand why kids don't do homework. If you live in a home that's high poverty, you live with people who for the most part do not have long-term plans. Long-term plans for a family of poverty on Monday is thinking to the next weekend. It is not planning an idea in their kids' heads about what they're going to do when they graduate from high school. If you will look at the next two pages, and again, I'm like to read them to you, and the reason I didn't stay with these is use them like as a spreadsheet for the next to each other. It talks about the hidden rules among classes, all the various things and how you look at things. For example, if you look at food, the key question in poverty is, did you have enough? And the quantity was important. How much there is. That's why there's they buy things like pasta and things that are full of carbohydrates because you can cook the big bag of pasta that you can get for a dollar fifty and you can feed six to eight people on it and it's gonna fill them up. Is it gonna be healthy? Not necessarily, but that's not what they're thinking about. If you look at something like money, money is something to be used or spent. It is not something to be saved or to think ahead. I'm getting paid on Wednesday, but my utility bill is due a week from Wednesday. So I need to make sure I save enough money to keep the lights and the water on. I got money on Wednesday, on Thursday and Friday, I'm spending that money. And that's why they're very, very geared toward immediate gratification kinds of things. And another one I think that's hardest to comprehend is time with people who live in poverty <coughs> present is the most important and decisions are made for the moment based on feelings <coughs> of survival. That is why, again, the frustration of when you're dealing with a parent and they don't show up for parent-teacher conference. Well, they may have had every intention a week or 10 days ago when they said they'd be there, but something else came up. You know, my girlfriend said, hey, do you want to go do this? And that was more important because that's something I get a social benefit out of. Not thinking in terms of, oh, I made this obligation 10 days ago to be there for my child. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, how that affects children. And then the last one that I've got for you is just something to maybe get you thinking about parent-teacher conferences that are coming up next month. On the left-hand side, these are some of the behaviors that are related to poverty such as laughing when discipline. You may have found that with your kids, that when you go to discipline them, they may laugh. It's a way for, if you're in poverty, it's a way to save face, particularly in a matriarchal uh, poverty situation, as well as a middle class world where there are few choices and little real power, is to be able to laugh at it. And what it is on the right is just a list of interventions as a person responding 
to that as opposed to getting angry or being frustrated or going, what is wrong with this person? So that's what I want you to understand. The school has certain obligations from a legal standpoint that we must serve these students. For many of these students, they're the only, we are the only hope that they have. I attended several years ago the National Homeless Conference, and this group, it was in Atlanta, this organization awards 24 scholarships every year, $2,000 each, for college scholarships for kids across the whole United States who have applied, who have been homeless or are currently homeless, to be able to go on to college or to go to professional school. What this organization does is they bring all 24 of those kids back, and, or they bring them all together, and these kids get to meet each other from all over. So there's kids they can relate to because they have the same backgrounds and they're looking forward to the same future. Every one of those kids, and they were all given the option to do or not do this, for about three hours on one evening of that conference stood up and talked to about, I think there were 4,000 people there, told them how they happened to be headed to college or professional school. Every, and I'm telling you, there wasn't a dry eye in the house after about the second kid, so you can imagine by the time we got to number 24. But every one of those children said it was a teacher or coach who gave me the hope that I learned that the only way basically out of the hell that I've been brought up in or that I live in now is education. That is the only way out. Not a single one of them said it was a grandma, grandpa, uncle, mother, father. Every single one said it was a teacher or a coach. And I always want to tell any group of educators I talk to the same thing. You may not know you're changing a life. You may not know you're saving a life. You may never hear about it from that kid. On the other hand, 10 years from now, you may hear back from that kid. But the point is that you're the one who puts the value in your mind that draws a, a future for them. In line with that, I want to tell you that we started a new after school program. We just got, and I want to tie that into poverty. We just got a new five year grant for the next five years for after school. It's a million six hundred forty thousand five hundred twenty two dollars. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pounds of this food, and the other one eats so many pounds of this food, and this is the cost per pound. 
And when they turn about six months, they're going to increase the poundage that they're eating each day. Which one is more expensive to raise? And then if we want to get more complicated, we look at what the figures say in terms of how much each of those weigh at the end of the year, approximately what they would weigh. And we say, how much was it per pound to raise that animal? And in technology, we maybe have them looking at what's the market right now? How much is beef going for? How much is pork going for? Um, what happens between the farmer and the grocery store in regards to how many other people are involved in getting that from the farm to the grocery store? But all the hands-on science would be geared toward agriculture, all of the math, all of the engineering. In the month of November, construction <coughs> is the focus. Construction will occur with, and will involve everything from architects to carpenters to, uh, rail, uh, to uh, highway engineers. And so just to give you one small sample of that, we'll be having kids get on the internet and find out how many cars can you get through a regular intersection with lights, with, two, with a stoplight and four coming from four directions versus a roundabout versus a diverging diamond. And they talk about that. Then we bring in a highway engineer who explains how do they go about designing those things and why do they design them and how did they come about. Or maybe we have the kids do some research technology-wise to find out what was the history of all of those. And then we get on a bus and do a short field trip where we take the kids around to the diverging diamond, a couple of roundabouts, and several intersections and we hope that after they've talked about this and studied it, that they see all of those in a different way, with a wider perspective of how they all work, instead of just someplace they're paying no attention to. The reason for this is kids who live in poverty at 74% free and reduced, and by the way, of that, I think about 64% are free and about 10% are reduced. So the majority of our kids are on free. Those kids do not have what's called future plans, or, or excuse me, future stories. In other words, a second grader is not going, not saying, I want to be a fireman when I grow up, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. What we're going to do is have a focus, K through 5, that's all about discovering your future story. That we hope kids change their minds three or four times by the end of the year of all the things they want to do because they're seeing new things they didn't know they could do. And then from 6 through 12, it's all about creating your future story. So that we're taking all of the academics that you guys teach, applying it to college and career readiness so it has relevance to them, so that they understand oh, I could go into medicine and never see a patient. I could be on a computer the whole time and be in medicine and do research in a lab. I don't have to deal with blood or puke or anything else. There's all kinds of opportunities for me in medicine, which most kids don't know about. So that's the direction we're going. It's all tied back to not just our homeless population, but our poverty population. As we're putting this all together, my goal is to be contacting you guys and saying, okay, math teachers, and you'll be paid for it, I need some problems in the area of construction. Here are the different areas we're gonna look at. I don't know what math a freshman's supposed to be able to do, a sophomore, junior, and senior. Can you give me some math questions, some problems that apply to this that kids can experiment with? And you guys write them and get them to us. So, that's where we're going with this. Um, lots of people have been asking me questions. I just wanted to clarify what that was all about. Do you have any questions? Are you asleep? <laughs> no, we want to take it. No. Okay, thank you very much.
parents have not paid as much attention the way there's a checkbox for it. So we are going to ask for your help. It's a minor thing. We're going to have a, a half sheet of paper at parent teacher conferences to have them fill out just the homeless section of enrollment. Because if we identify more homeless students, it doesn't say homeless on it, it just says living situation. If we identify more homeless students, then next year when the homeless grant comes up again, we will have a much higher probability of receiving that grant, which the grant is for how much money? Well, if you get $400, you can apply for up to $400 per student. Yeah, so it depends. The more students we have identified, the higher probability it is that we would get that grant. So just when that comes out, you're like, oh, we're well, going to get parents, 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 just know that that's why. I just want to throw that out there. So. Okay, Dr. 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 Dr.